Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Bill Demarest, and I am speaking to you from an undisclosed location uh, somewhere on this planet. I would like to greet all of you fellow and fellow at Truth Seekers. Uh, I just connected with uh, Mr. Gary Byrne, and he is in studio with me now. And I spoke to him Friday, and he is such such a, a regular guy, a very, very nice gentleman. And tonight we're going to discuss his book, Crisis of Character. I heard him on Susan Lindauer's show, and I figured he would make one very special guest. And I wish to introduce you to Mr. Gary Byrne. Gary, are you there? I am. Oh, Hello. thank you. Yes, I'm quite new at this, and this will be my first interview. And I, it is such a special honor to have you on my very first interview show. But I know you are such a regular guy. We spoke on the phone uh, Friday, and I told all the people I work with and my friends that you are just such a regular guy. And it really does, it, it does my heart good to be able to speak to such a uh a true patriot. Let, let me ask you, um, for, for, for beginners, let me ask you a, a personal question for sure. me. What kind of guts and stamina does it take to be willing to take a bullet for a, um, I, I'm sure you're awake and aware that these people in the White House, they're only puppets. Right. They're, they're controlled by the elite. The word is um, figurehead for an elite corrupt system enslaving us. What 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 kind of person would take on this job? And and I don't mean at all to demean. I, I you sure. are such an honorable person. Sure, I, I know what you mean. Tell me what it takes to do this job. Sure. So basically, for me, Bill, the way I worked it is, you know, I, I decided uh, years ago. You know, when I started as an Air Force security policeman, and the Air Force in their training made it very clear that, you know, if you were ever taken hostage in your line of duty and they threaten to, to, to kill you, then you, you better start saying your prayers because the Air Force was not going to negotiate for your safety in that type of situation. And somewhere along the line, I decided that it was the right thing to do to protect people. And, you know, when I became a Secret Service Uniform Division officer in the early 1991, um, you have to set the politics aside. Of course, you know, the first president I protected was President George Herbert Walker Bush, who was a very honorable guy. And, uh, you know, was a war hero. You know, whether people agree with his politics or not, he was a decent, kind human being. And things changed when the Clintons got in there, but it doesn't change what the, con the way the Constitution's written. And you're protecting the office of the presidency, not so much the man or the woman or, or however, you know, you want to put it. It takes a little bit of um, getting used to, but you just decide that's the right thing to do. And for people like me, uh, it, you know, I want to do the right thing. And, and I, I never had any problems with it. My, my biggest fear was um, failure. You know, what if I didn't get it right? What if something happened and I didn't move fast enough or I wasn't accurate enough? That's what drove me to, to, uh, to the levels that I, that I got to. So. Yeah, I understand that. I, I understand that uh, skill level that you have to attain to satisfy yourself. Uh, why, why in the world would you write such a book? As I'm sure you of all people are aware of the Clinton killing machine leaving dead bodies in its wake do, yeah. do, do you live in a vault no nope i live in a house uh, outside of philadelphia i live like a free man i get exactly what you're saying and, and um <clears throat> i experienced this similar concerns back when i got subpoenaed during bill clinton's um scandal with monica Lewinsky. so here's the way i when i decided to write this book i wrote it because i want the american people to know the truth bill I want them to know who the real Hillary Clinton is. And they're never going to get that kind of transparency from anybody else other than somebody like me. And, you know, I spent 29 years protecting the Air Force personnel, nuclear weapons, 12 years in the Secret Service Uniform Division, 13 years as a federal air marshal flying all over the world, protecting our citizens and our airliners. And, and I've, I've hung up that badge, but now my job, my mission is to get the truth out. I'm not telling people how to vote, Bill. Vote however you see fit. But this is the truth. What's in my book, Crisis of Character, what I'm going to talk about tonight is exactly what happened. 
what I've subpoenaed to testify about, what I witnessed, what I heard, what I saw, and what I did. Yes, I understand now. You're, you're protecting the office and doing your duty. Uh, can I ask you, of all the sheer and truly disturbing actions or incidents you saw, what event or circumstance bothers you the most? Well, you know, it's actually a simple one. I mean, maybe not simple. It's simple in the in the big picture, but one of my coworkers, who was a veteran of the U.S. Army, was walking down the West Colonnade at the White House one time. That's the outside walkway that takes you from the mansion, the White House mansion living quarters, over on the ground floor over to the West Wing. And he was walking down the colonnade. He'd been up all night protecting the first family. And the first lady walked by him, and he said, good morning, first lady, and she told him to go F himself. Now, there's many, many examples of Hillary Clinton being incredibly cruel and and rude and mean to people and especially the military and law enforcement but the reason this one always bothered me was because three and a half to four years before that this guy was in the u.s army and he was serving he was deployed by president bill clinton to one of the earlier missions in somalia uh, not the one we now know as black hawk down but before that and um, he received a purple heart he was wounded he was hit by a sniper they went underneath his body armor. He was severely injured, and he, but he recovered. And he got a job with the Secret Service Uniform Division. And then the, what, the first lady or the wife of the commander-in-chief that sent him on the mission tells him to go F himself. I'm sorry, that's just unacceptable behavior. And that's, why it, you know, that's one of the reasons I want the American people to know who the truth is. And they will stop at nothing to get more power and more control. And they will say anything for her to become president of the United States. And we've seen that already. Yep. Uh, our, our, listeners are, our listeners are very aware of disrespect for the American people. Uh, let me ask you, other than Bill Clinton being so bold in stating that he, he lied and never having sexual relations with Monica, one thing about this whole incident, which cooks my can to borrow a line from another host, is the hot coals they dragged Linda Tripp over. I, I do remember that, and, and I've heard her story on Larry King Live. This woman was dragged through the coals and then her health issues. And when I, when I, when I think about Linda Tripp, that she is one person that got more burned than anybody else in this whole soap opera. And, and I, I have to ask you about what you know about Linda Tripp, because it really does tear at me. It really does. I agree 100%. I'm going to tell you a little story about Linda Tripp. I knew her. She was an employee. She was actually a really good government employee. She had a lot of high-up positions, office managers. She helped a lot of high-up people. I don't remember her whole, whole list of uh, jobs. You on, know, both, on both sides of the aisle. I know that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She was a real, a real worker. And uh, I used to see her around the West Wing and the White House and the old executive office building all the time. I knew her. I used to say hi to her. She was always very polite. Um, and you're right. She got the worst hammering of anybody. And one of the last things I remember seeing of her was she was in, trying to get into her townhouse. She lived in Maryland, and she was, her kids were teenagers. This is during the Lewinsky scandal. And the press is out there. She can't even get to her house. And you can see she's flustered. She's trying to keep her composure because her kids are with her. They're yelling questions to her, and somebody starts yelling, you know, rude, incredibly rude things about her appearance and and I wanted, I, I'm telling you, Bill, it took everything I had not to jump in a car and drive over there and just go to somebody's backside. It was unacceptable. But this is what happens when you try to do the right thing and it goes against the Clintons. Linda Tripp was a good, it is a good, decent, honest, law-abiding citizen. She did the right thing. And I also believe her actions probably saved Monica Lewinsky's life. That's my belief based on what I saw. And she certainly saved my career and other people's careers, because without that blue dress, without that DNA, it would have been our word against Bill Clinton's, and Judge Starr never would have relented. He was, you know, he had a job to do, and, and he was going to do it, and we would have been massacred. Yeah, that's that, that's the take I got on it, but uh, she was being sued for uh, disclosing uh, secrets on personal this, and Monica sued her, and, and from what I got from that story, it was, it was a mutual understanding uh she did nothing wrong. She was a witness to a crime, and she reported it. Yes. If, you, if you don't report a crime, you're just as guilty. Yes, yes. She could have faced charges also. And the only reason Monica isn't in jail now is because she cut a deal with the FBI because they had her cold. 
And the, the truth was, I mean, I don't know. I remember in, in testimony and stuff that I heard when I was giving testimony, you know, that, that Linda wasn't the only one she was shooting her mouth off to. Now, I know, I don't know who exactly ended up having to testify. It, this, this, this all falls back on the behavior of two people, the bad behavior of two people, Bill Clinton, who was the president of the United States at the time, and Monica Lewinsky, who started out as an intern. Linda Tripp did the right legal thing, and I'm so grateful for her that she did, believe me. That that's that was my take on from what I've researched on it because I as I said Linda Linda was the one she suffered the most and then she had yes. cancer and yeah. radiation and the the hell she went through being raked over the coals it was radioactive coals anything else on Linda you'd like to share at the moment well just the fact that I'm grateful that 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 she survived um, she uh, she sent me a message about I don't know right after my book came out. Through a friend of a friend, an acquaintance of a friend, she sent me a message telling me that she was grateful that I wrote the book, um, and and I thought that was very nice. But at the time, you know, when when all this was happening, when we were being subpoenaed, I mean, I really wanted to reach out to her, but it was just what it. I was afraid I would damage her. You know, I didn't want it to look like we were the we words, were, right? No, right. And it was. I mean, when I found out what she did, I'm telling you, I mean, she saved us. I mean, and she clearly, in my opinion, she clear. I mean, it, I know some people think this is a little overboard, but I, I really do think she saved Lewinsky's life. I did. Yeah, um, that's that's, that's the, my take. That's the take I got on it too. And and she she's even said that. And and Monica goes ahead and wants to sue her for disclosing secrets about her. Right. Uh, yeah, it it was such it was such a mess. And the funny thing is, I remember Bill Clinton's lie. I did not have sexual right. relations with that woman. Yeah. I was driving back. I was driving from the doctor's office after having back surgery, and I was headed headed across Florida to my mom's house in Sebring to uh, recuperate. And on the radio, it was broadcast on the radio. When I heard that, I I, I wanted to, uh, you know, I mean, it's what can you do? It was one of the most frustrating moments in my life, other than hearing the towers go down on my in right. my car on my way back to work from break. Right. Uh, so, so. Along those same lines, when I watched him, I sat with my wife um, in the in the uh, family room of her house in Maryland at the time, and we watched him give that speech. <laughs> and, that t- and I'm telling you, I put my head down on my hand. She put her hand on my back, and she said, what's wrong? And I, I started to cry. I said, we are so screwed. Oh, my because God. Because this guy could not do the right thing. We are so – and I wasn't worried about me because, listen, I will, I will always survive. I, I just – I'm one of those people – Somebody looks out for me, Bill. But I was concerned about my coworkers. Yeah. And um and you know, it was tough on everybody and it, and and even some of the agents that got subpoenaed. We were getting we were getting hammered because one guy who took an oath couldn't stand up to that oath. Oh. And one guy who was supposed to be a man couldn't stand up and be a man and say, I did it, this is what happened, let's move on. Instead we had to spend, oh my God, I don't know how many millions of dollars on this investigation and he still had to, you know, say he did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, other than taking a bullet for, for somebody to protect, per se, the office, well, what it, what's one of the biggest fears that the Secret Service uh, agency has at this moment? Because they've they, they got to be going through hell. They, they, they've got to seriously be shaken by all of this. Is there sure. any fear in the service? Sure. You know, and I have to, I have to, to be completely honest, I have to you know, admit publicly that, you know, clearly writing my book, Crisis of Character, has put some pressure on the Secret Service. Now, they have not commented publicly, but of course, as you know, the retired Secret Service Agents Association has come out, but the Secret Service itself has not commented. And and I, and I am, that is one of the things, you know, putting more pressure on the service by coming out and talking, it weighed on me heavily. It still does. I'm, I'm glad I wrote the book. Don't get me wrong, Bill. Absolutely. But, but if I could take away the pressure it puts on the service, I would like to, but that, that's just not going to happen. But the way I weigh that is, you know, what if I had witnessed, instead of what I witnessed, what if I had witnessed a protectee or his his adult child accidentally kill somebody, you know, accidentally run over somebody with a boat, we'll say. Yeah. Would the service and, and that person died and the family didn't know what happened to him, would I be, you know, would they think I would not ever come clean? And, you know, and they wanted to keep it quiet to protect the protectee. Where do you draw that line? 
Well, where I draw the line is, is you're going to have to come out and tell the truth. And, and clearly I've drawn that line with my book, Crisis of Character. I, the things I saw are so contra- so reverse of what normal <laughs> behavior is. And believe me, my audience knows everything you're yeah. talking about. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, so that's why I came forward. So I think when it comes to the Secret Service, what they're concerned about is if she wins, they're going to step. They're going to step up and do the right thing. They yeah. will protect her. And I'll and I'll say this, and I mean this from the bottom of my soul. If I was still in the Secret Service uniform division and she got elected president, I would protect her 100 percent because that's what it calls for. That's what the job is. You don't do it when it's easy. You don't do it when it's fun. You do it all the time, and and you always try to do the right thing. And I would. But uh, with that said, if she wins. They're in for a rough time because, oh, my God, <laughs> we, you know, basically I, I myself and, you know, I poked the bear and yeah. um, and unfortunately they are, they could end up being the ones getting bit. So um, it weighs on me. Believe me. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, on uh, Susan Lindauer's show, you must tell about Hillary and the Bible. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, please do. So, um I'm st- I come in one morning and I get an early morning workout in at the White House and um, I take my post. But an hour later, the president comes over. And of course, when the president comes over to the uh, outside the Oval Office, I'm sorry, my post was right outside the Oval Office at this time. And the president comes over. So the agents come over and, and we're standing there talking outside the Oval Office, um, this agent and I. And I said, hey, I heard this rumor in the gym this morning <laughs> that um, that Mrs. Clinton threw a fit in a in the limousine and and threw something, you know, hit, hit the agent with something, uh, with a book. And, and he says, yeah, it was me. And I'm like, what? You know, and, and, and these guys, I mean, listen, I, you know, every Secret Service agent that I worked with wasn't a great guy, but most of them were. And I may not agree with their management style, but I like these guys. I, I, I admire the work that they do. But and this guy and I had a good rapport. And uh, I knew he was a real, you know, he was a real physical guy. He was a good fighter. He was a st- strong guy. And I looked at him, and he, and he told me the story. So she, he's sitting in the front seat of the car on the left side. He's driving, or he would be driving. They're sitting on the south lawn of the White House. And that's the side of the White House that's the closest to the Washington Monument. The First Lady's already in the car. And for some, for some reason, they get stalled, like they're not leaving for some reason. And wherever they're going, she's got a Bible with her. <laughs> and she gets so angry, she stomps her feet on the floor, she leans forward, and she punches him in the back of the head with the Bible. And he spins around in the car. Now, it's hard to turn around in these, in these Cadillacs because of the way they're built. And, uh, but he turns around as best he can, and he makes it very clear to her as best he can that that's unacceptable. And he reported it, and it was investigated, but what are you going to do? You know? and, and he told me about it, and I kind of laughed, and I, and I said, um, it's just hard to believe. And he looked at me, and he said, Basically, you know, after a couple of minutes, we were talking. He said, Gary, if anybody sh- should um, should understand what happened to me, you should. And I said, you're right, you know, because he knew the stuff that had happened to me with getting berated by her before. So anytime, and I don't know if I said this on, on, on the, the other show I was on, but I said it on one of the shows I was on. And, and I know this sounds harsh, but anytime you see Hillary Clinton with a Bible <laughs> or referring, to, referring to religion, yeah. it's nothing but a Prop. It is nothing but a prop. You cannot behave like she does, and 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 believe in in, in the in the teachings of the Bible. That's just my life. That's just my opinion, and, and based on what I saw. Yeah, it def- definitely. It, it it Bible must be uh, written backwards, upside down, and sideways because she <laughs> certainly she certainly you know is known to have gone to a cult, witch uh, witch covens, etc. You mentioned the 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 loyalty and this and that. I watched Hillary stumble, fall, go to the ground, and then put her in that van. Yes. What, what, I mean, I cannot comprehend your service and these people loving and mothering her. Is it just the job or? Yes. It, it's just the job, and they, yes. and, they, and they do it well. Yes, and everything you saw them do to help her, my take on, you know, and I wasn't there, and I haven't talked to anybody that was there. But my experiences in those eight years, when she got to wherever they were going, her family member's house, and she felt better, as soon as she realized what happened, I'm sure she, be, and, and she found out, somebody videotaped it, I, 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 could, I would bet you a hundred bucks that she berated the living crap out of them, Bill. But she berated them, she screamed and yelled and blamed them for everything. That's just the way she is. She's a dictator. She has, 
She has no leadership style whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, we, we have about three minutes uh, till break. Uh, tell, us, tell us where we can uh, get your book. I, I want to get into something at the other side of the break. Tell us where sure. can we... And before you do that, I, I got a, I got to borrow a line from Susan Lindauer. She said, people, go out and buy five copies of this book and give them out to anybody who's not sure whether or not they're going to vote for Hillary. And, you know, they're leaning towards Hillary. You've got to get this book in these people's hands. To, to When I speak to somebody and they say, well, Hillary, uh, I, I can't. I, I, all I want to do is choke. I want to choke them yeah. as well as myself because it's like. Don't you have any idea? So tell us where we can get your book. And if you have any websites, please. Sure. My book can be found at any normal bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Books a Million. It can also be found on um, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, my uh, Twitter is at Gary Byrne, at author Gary James Byrne. Um, you can just Google my name, Gary, B-Y-R-N-E, and it will bring up my uh, YouTube channel. You can find my YouTube channel the different websites that I have and uh, information about my book. And, uh, and and I appreciate you for asking me that. Thank you. Uh, of course, I have to, because I personally, uh, Susan Lindauer's uh, one Sunday she show, she said, oh, I'd love to get Gary Byrne, but he's too big for me. And I wrote back not because, you know, I was listening to your very first radio interview on WYOD here in Miami, and I said, no. Here's a man that's got to get the truth out. Susan Lindauer is, is not small potatoes being the ex-CIA operative she used yeah. to be. Uh, we're we're yeah, asking good people. Oh, she really is. And and I, 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 I do videos for her. And now she's asked me to do some uh, new intro music. Uh, we, we've had a difference of opinion. I've had to I had to redo that one video because she didn't like it. And I spent another like six hours on that video, which I think I sent to you as well as the original. But yeah, I got in touch with you through Facebook and your media person got back to me and with your phone number and I just passed it along to Susan. And as I said, I spoke, I spoke to you on Friday and you are such a, a regular guy. And right now I'm not doing an interview. Uh, I'm, I'm chatting with a very good friend who's about to open some more eyes as, as hard as I try. It's sometimes it's very, very difficult. So I'll catch you on the other side of the break in less than a minute. And uh, hey, are, are you uh, giving out any signed copies? Because I, sir, would love one. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I get some more copies, then I'll be sure to put you on my list. Okay. Thank you, sir. You bet. Uh, on the other side, I want you to think about... Uh, what I mean, I've seen forensics that prove that at least two women are being substituted for her over the past couple of months just to get people used to see, seeing this person. And, and, you know, there is a conspiracy theory. There is a conspiracy theory that we have the ability to clone uh, Hillary Clinton. I'd like to get your opinion on the other side of the break, sir. Okay. Uh, speak to you then. Okay. Thank you. And we're back with Gary Byrne, author of Crisis of Character, and we were chatting, and I, I, I wish he lived closer. We'd go bike riding and, and just, you know, <laughs> hang out. I mean, he, he really is uh, one hell of a gentleman. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of conspiracies, but I, yeah. I've, I've, seen, I've seen the photographs. I've seen the pictures. The ears aren't the same. The noses aren't the same. The mole isn't there. I mean, forensics proves that there are at least there are at least two women that have been playing her part in speeches and, and rallies and stuff. My audience knows that we've had the capability to clone people for so long and the mean the science and the means to do such a thing. What is your take on this? Well, my first thing is that, oh, my God, if we have the ability to clone somebody, we chose her. <laughs> my thoughts exactly <laughs> to, to, um, from, a, from a legal standpoint and having been somebody who was in the secret service for a very long time for 12 years we, they legally can't use a double because you're basically setting somebody else up to possibly be murdered or attacked there's a lot of legal ramifications but I can, I will tell you this now I've seen I've seen some of the things that, you, that you're talking about and here's what I attribute it to one 
she's she's very sick with something. I'm not a doctor, uh, as you well know, but I am an expert in observation. And I've observed some of the things you've seen, but I think whatever's wrong with her is, is makes her look different at times. I think what you see, for instance, when she had that episode at the 9-11 memorial, then when we saw her again, people thought it was somebody different because she looked so different. You have to remember when they had her at her family member's apartment, they redid all her makeup. Mm -hmm. You know, they fixed her hair. They, 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 you know, now I realize that doesn't change the size of your ears and that kind of stuff, but it's my, it's my feeling based on my experiences that it's the same, you know, thank God for this. It's just one Hillary Clinton (laughs) <laughs> and it's just one, one defective, one defective Hillary Clinton as opposed to multiple oh. defective Hillary Clintons. But listen, I will say this, and I'm not just saying this to cover my backside. If one day we find out it's true, nothing would shock me that they were the first to do it. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't surprise me a bit. Just like none of the other crazy stuff I've seen them do over the years surprises me. Where she pops out of um, Webb Hubble's daughter's apartment. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you know that. She's I've heard those stories. Sure, they're not I, stories. I, it, it, you know, the uh, Inquirer. They they've genetically proven, it. and if you look at the pictures, there's no mistake. I've seen it. Yeah, Listen, and, I I stood right in front of Web, Web Hubble probably <laughs> ten times, fifteen times in my life. The same with Vince Foster. I I get what you're saying. I yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. And Vince Foster. I was trying to remember his name, and I keep getting mixed up with uh, Stevens. Now, I I was the one on Susan Lindauer's show in the chat room that mentioned Waco. Yeah. Uh, my next guest, Brooks Agnew, it's like the proof that Hillary wanted, I, I don't want to take control of, of you know, what, what you know about this, mm-hmm. but Hillary Clinton wanted the news media for herself. Waco came up. She for, forced Janet Reno to go in there and end it. And Janet Reno was begging, please don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. And when Stevens found out, not Stevens, Foster found out that right. he, he couldn't handle it. I mean, he, he literally broke down. But, you know, when you find a body in the park with two bullet holes in it and the body's covered with uh, carpet fibers and there's no mud on the shoes, you, you know the, the trail of death uh, behind Hillary. Let me ask you, where do you go from here? Fame and fortune with the book sales and with not too much, not too bright a spotlight on you. Uh, the movie certainly will never come out till long <laughs> after 9-11 is, uh, is forgotten. You know, I mean, yeah. no, no one will ever produce this movie. Yeah. So, so where do you go from here? So, you know, I'm going to um, I'm going to keep promoting the book until after the election. And then after the first of the year, I'm going to start looking for a job somewhere. I retired in March from 29 years of government service, as you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go on. And I'm going to, my wife and I are going to raise our, finish raising our kids and we're going to enjoy them and, and life goes on. I'll have to work again. You know, uh, my book is selling very well. Don't get me wrong. We've sold um, over 440,000 copies as of two weeks ago. It sold three, over three, 300,000 copies of just the hardcover and well over, you know, and, and another 140 to, or so, thousand copies of the electronic version. Did, so. did, I got it. Did, did you get an advance for this book? I did get a small advance. <laughs> um, my my LLC and and the uh, my agent. We you know we split it. Um, I got two small checks that covered me. You know, helped cover my expenses, living expenses, right after I retired for a little bit. But the truth is, I don't get. We don't get our first check from the book sales until uh, March. So uh, things are getting a little tight, but you know that's my problem. We'll we'll work through it. We're taking steps to to fix that. But um, I'll go back to work uh, after the first of the year. I'll start looking for a job, and uh, and life will go on. And I'm and I'll always be grateful of the way I was treated by by you, by the other radio shows, by Fox News, and by the people. I mean, the messages I get are so incredible. I mean, you're aware of them. You you know, yeah. talk. I'm I'm I did the right thing. I'm glad I did it, and uh, and life goes on. It's a shame that the good people have to suffer. So, um, so, Dr. Bill Deagle, and, and I've known him for years, he said when he met Hillary and shook her hand, it, it sent cold shivers up, up his spine. And as David Icke might say, she had the soul of a reptilian. Any, any impressions on her actually being a reptilian? I don't know if you... <laughs> no, no, but I will tell you this. Is she that cold? 
Yes, she is. And I, that's just the way it's, as you know, it's just the way I describe her in my book, Christ as a character. She's cold, distant. It's almost like she has a, there's something missing from her as far as the ability to actually show that you care for somebody or, or, or to, to interact with people. She really is bizarre. Um, and when you see her doing it, it's so obvious that she's acting. Um, that, that was my experience. Uh, I will tell you, I don't think I've ever said this to anybody before, so this is going to be a, a, a break yeah, for your for your show. Yes, thank you. And it's very, it's kind of humorous. But when I worked there, and um, you know, a lot of the guy, old old timers, and I talk about some of these guys in my book. I refer to one of them as Krusty. It's a, you know, just a made up nickname. And some of these old timers, you know, there were Vietnam veterans. These were guys were the Patriots, Patriot, and uh, they used to refer to her. They just, and, you know if they were referring to her in our little group where nobody could overhear us, they used to refer to her as Satan. And, and that's oh, a true story. Her, her and, daughter, you know, Satan's daughter. I mean, that, that everybody in my audience would say, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they definitely. Yeah. They didn't mean it literally, but, but certainly they didn't like her. They didn't like the way she, she treated uh, people. And they certainly didn't like some of the, you know, one of the first large events that the Clintons had, one of their guests was Jane Fonda. And of course, anybody that was in the Vietnam War, was not fond of Jane Fonda. And no. uh, so there was a lot of tension there. So, yeah, they used to refer to her as uh, Satan in, 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 in certain circles. So, true story, yeah. of course. I, I just want to say that uh, I, I worked the uh, Democratic and Republican National Conventions down here in Miami in 72 uh-huh. and ran into Jane Fonda. I actually had the opportunity to shake Nixon's hand. And, yeah. other, and other than speaking to you, my greatest and honorable moment in my life was when I backed away from shaking George Nixon, George Nixon, <laughs> Richard Nixon's hand. And the reason George comes to mind, I walked past security and George Wallace was sitting in a wheelchair and yeah. I shook George Wallace's hand. Now yeah. that blew me away. Uh, and, and Jane, Fonda, I, I just wanted to interject here a little bit. You know, that movie born on the 4th of July I do. and the riots after it. Yeah. I was there. It never okay. happened. It never Not happened. Right. <laughs> right, too funny. Uh, yeah, they um, some of the some of the old timers I worked with when she came into the White House had some choice things to say. I won't re- I won't repeat it on your show, but yeah, it, it was very humorous. Yeah. Anyway, and, and that's it. My, my audience would never forgive me. Uh, I, what is the most disturbing action in your mind, and perhaps even what you thought Bill did that is so over the top or so beneath? What What's the one? disturbing things she did besides you know using the bible as a weapon to a fellow i i'd I'd say um you know i i'd say the story i told told you earlier about her uh telling the uh the former vet the veteran and and ud officer to go f himself that one just always bothered me because he was such a decent guy and i just can't imagine anybody treating anybody you know and that this is the thing when you know this is one of the things i want to i when i try to compel people to read my book bill it's not about selling books. It's about getting the message out. And here's the message. One of the messages I want you to understand. Can you imagine being it in the, in the, uh, at the place where you get your car worked on or at your, at your child's pediatrician and you saw them treating their employees or acting like this, you would never use them again. You would take your kid and run out the door and you would take your car anywhere, but there to get it fixed because people, normal, decent people don't behave like that regardless of what pressures are on them. You know, it's just not normal behavior. And that's what Hillary Clinton is. She's abnormal. She's, she's completely angry, she's distant, cold, and she just doesn't function properly. And she's, she is no leader. And she is that reptilian. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to be personal about your, you know, you know, your advance on the book because no, uh, you, you think about the money she got for her book. And she's, I don't think she sold. I don't think she sold 150 of her books. That's yeah. That's that's why that's why I was asking that. You know, I, I know Susan kept dragging you back to the real real dirt of Bill and Monica and and um, sure. The, the granddaughter in the bathroom and the uh, the Navy steward. That that's a great story. To, to tell my audience that because not too many people are up at eleven o'clock when when Susan's show was on. That that one. I told the guys that worked that, and they What's just the, what, what you talk about with the Navy steward with the towels. The towels, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so one day um, I'm working my post, and and you know by this time it's clear that 
that Bill Clinton is having an affair with this intern. You know, we're, it's just every day something else crazy happens. And so the Navy Stewart, the president was in the Oval Office and he left and went back over to the, over to the mansion. And apparently while he was in there, he had a, you know, a liaison or whatever you want to call it with, with Monica Lewinsky. And when he left, he left some towels. There's a couple different stories where he left some towels one time and, and another time there were tissues with lipstick. But this one particular time, it was a towel and there was fluids from a man in the towel. <laughs> and the steward was very aggravated. He was he was embarrassed. And he basically said, you know, I'm tired of cleaning up this crap. And, and I understood. And I said, look, um, these towels, I, you know, I, I know where they're going to go. They're going to go downstairs. And the young guys that work for you, they're going to wash them. They're going to see this. They know what it is. They're you know, young, young men in the Navy. You know? <laughs> so I said, why don't we do this now? Uh, why don't we give me the towels? I got a plastic bag out of the bottom of the trash can. I got a trash can liner out of the bottom of the trash can. And he threw the towels in there and I destroyed them. Now, needless to say that, you know, a year, 18 months later, when the subpoena started flying, I, I was nervous about being accused of destroying, you know, evidence. Well, of course, it wasn't evidence at the time. I was, you know... And this is just an example that, that, that I hope your, your listeners understand. Oh, well, they do. It's, I tried to help this guy help himself. I, I destroyed the towels to, to eliminate more, more reputation-destroying rumors. And, and you can't even help them help themselves. That's one of two times that I worked there that I tried to help him you know, help himself. And you just can't help them. They just go from one scandal to the next. And his wife is the same way. I mean, she was Secretary of the State for what four years, and we've and how many scandals do we have? At mm-hmm. least two: Benghazi, the email server, and the email server is like the scandal that it won't go away. Every twenty days, it's something else. Uh, you know, it's just insane. So yeah, I destroyed the towels, and uh, and it was a, it was um, it was crazy. <laughs> what? Well- I'm I'm glad you told that story because not, I did forget about it. I'm talking about the steward opening up the bathroom door, and no, was, it, was, it, the was it was it was it Mondale's granddaughter? Yeah, no, it was it was Mondale's daughter. The oh, map daughter. Room. I'm sorry. Yes. So this is yeah, this, <laughs> this is funny too. So it's not this one's not as stressful. <laughs> like. So it's around Christmas time, one Christmas in the early '90s, and I'm walking from the east side of the White House over to the West Wing, back to my post. I, I went over to the east side to, to get some food and um, to eat. So I'm walking back along the ground floor, right outside the map room at the base uh, of the president's stairwell and elevators. There's a room called the map room, and there's a post right there. And um, so I stop. I'm talking to the UD officer there and the agent, and, and we're talking. And, and the Navy steward walks up, and he's got a clean shirt for the president. And as he's talking to us, he heads towards the map room, you know, we're talking to him, and he opens up the door. Now, he's looking at us in the hallway. We're looking at him, past him, and in the room, when he opens the door, we see President Clinton standing there face-to-face with Eleanor Mondale, making out like high school seniors. <laughs> and, of course, he's looking at us, and all of a sudden, he realizes the look on our faces, there's something wrong. He turns around and looks into the room, and he sees what we see, and he gets embarrassed and flustered, and he closes the door, and he takes off down the hallway. So, you know, of course, we look at each other and we kind of smirked and said, you know, Merry Christmas. Welcome to the White House. You know, <laughs> just another Christmas. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a crazy one. Another really great story is uh, when the Clintons came into the White House, it was like a hippie invasion. I, I still laugh when, when you, you speak of the stickers and the guy around the yeah. pool. Yeah, let, let, let's hear that. We have a sure. little more time. Sure. Yeah, the first one is. You know, I think it was the, the first Sunday night that, that they were in office. I'm standing at my post outside the Oval Office. You know, each administration sets their own rules, you know, ask the Secret Service, the Uniform Division, or the Secret Service in general, to enforce, enforce certain rules as far as when they're going to let their staff pass holders to do tours, you know, walk by the Oval Office and do tours. And they don't want it done during business hours. Anyway, the Bush administration had just left. The Clintons had just come in. There, there were no rules yet. So we were trying to be flexible, you know. And, and so this guy who comes walking up, he was kind of short in stature. He was kind of heavy set. And he had this beautiful necklace around his neck. It was it was like a, a piece of uh, rawhide or leather. And it had these big metal rings. I forget how many rings. I want to say five or seven, <laughs> maybe seven rings. And each one was a different color. 
and they were they were big, you know, big in size, uh, the rings. And and he walked up to me, right, right close. You know, and, and you know, people in general, and especially cops that do what I do, you know, we don't like people getting in our space. You know, <laughs> so he kind of got close to me, and I backed up as far as I could. I had my back right up to the Oval Office, you know, the wall there, the Oval Office with the open door, and um, and he sticks his thumb underneath the necklace, like under his chin, and pushes it up like towards my face, and he says. This is my gay freedom pride necklace. <laughs> and I just, I looked at him and I, I said, oh, well, okay. Well, well, good for you. Congratulations. You know, what are you going to say? And I guess he's that, and you know, I thought at the time, and certainly when I was writing the book, I, I thought, I guess he, was, he thought because I was a cop or in the Secret Service, I was homophobic, you know, which <laughs> is not true. I don't care what you do in your personal life. That's right. You know, and the guy standing with him, he had this guy. Now, this, the, the uh, pass holder had a temporary pass. And technically, he shouldn't have been escorting anybody. But again, we were trying to be, you know, a little flexible at the time. And so he had the guest with him with a guest pass. They moved, I think they moved towards like the opening of the door, like they were going to walk in. And I said, no, you can't go in. He, I said, you have to look at it from out here. And he said, well, you know, we make the rules now. And I said, <laughs> well, yeah, I listened. I said, that's not really the way it works here. Uh-huh. So anyway, they said a couple things back and forth. They looked around. You know, and then they start walking down the hallway. Now, the direction they were walking in would have been west, and they would have been moving down toward, moving through basically the remainder of the West Wing towards the chief of staff's office, towards the vice president's office that way. And as they're moving down, I see the guy, the skinny guy, and he's putting stickers. He's doing something like, and I look and he's putting stickers on the priceless white house furniture, the, the, the immaculate, you know, painted walls and the artwork. He's putting stickers on it. <laughs> and, I, and I yell, stop. And they look back and they said something about we're in charge again. And I said, no. And I went over the radio and I, um, you know, to put it in context for your listeners, the White House is a working museum. Mm-hmm. I mean, when, when, just to give you some context, when Ronald Reagan was president, each carpet that a president has has the presidential seal in the middle of the floor. Yeah. He wouldn't walk across the seal. Exactly. I, I, I didn't either. Yeah. I walked through that room 10 times a day when I worked there. And I always left over it or walked around it. But anyway, so they're sticking stickers on this priceless furniture. You know, it's almost as old as the country. And uh, so I go, I call for help over the radio. A sergeant and an officer showed up. They took control of the situation. They took them out to the gate. And that's the last I saw of them. Um, then I caught, got on the phone and I called the GSA, the people who clean that part of the White House. And then I actually called the mansion people. And they don't generally clean that side. They're, they're in charge of the mansion. But they're very good at fixing stuff, cleaning stuff, getting, you know. So they came over and helped these guys because you just couldn't pull the stickers off because we were afraid it would pull the, you know, the veneer off or the, the, the finish and, and uh, the paint off the walls. So it, it was, uh, it didn't go over well. We reported it to the, to the chief of staff the next day, you know, through the chain of command, and it didn't go over well. And that was my, kind of my first experience. And, um, and, 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 you know, there's probably another 20 stories you know, that same month or that same week that just didn't, you know, either got edited out or, or I didn't remember it well right. enough to write about. It, so I, I think we have enough um, enough time to uh, sure. you went to uh, White House staff about stopping Monica from, you know, and Bill from doing what they were doing. And, and you went to her and they fired her and Monica come up to you with a pass. Tell that story. Sure. So <laughs> first, you know, it's not my it's not my job or the Secret Service's job to tell the president who he can do whatever with, so to speak, or who he can see. But you you have it right. So you know by this time Monica Lewinsky is she's still an intern and she's coming back and forth all the time and she's getting her foot in the door. Now originally I thought it was just a young woman trying to get a better job or a paying job, and, and I gave her the benefit of the doubt. But by this time I'm having doubts. So. A woman that worked for Bill Clinton, as a matter of fact, she was the first appointed female, a woman, uh, deputy chief of staff in the government. And her name was Evelyn Lieberman. And I loved her. She was great. Mm-hmm. She was hard as a, she was hard as nails. She would speak her mind. She was, we had this great rapport. Like she'd come up and just start berating me, you know, just to berate <laughs> me, you know, joking around. And, yeah, yeah. And, like one time she came up to me, and this is one of the reasons I went to her. One time she came up to me, she goes, why are all these people in the hallway drinking soda? And I said, they're not my employees, they're yours. <laughs> and she goes, you're right, they are. And then she, you know, she put out a memo 
tell them to stay out and stop spilling coffee and soda all over the damn, you know, hundred dollar a yard carpet, you know. And, and um, so anyway, so um, things were getting tense. My coworkers, uniform division officers that I worked with in the West Wing, and some of the agents were concerned about Monica coming in all the time. She wasn't supposed to be there. So I decided to go talk to Evelyn Lieberman about it. I kind of, I was stepping over my bounds a little bit, but I thought it was the right thing to do. So I did it. And so I went and saw her secretary, her assistant, very nice woman. I can't remember her name, young girl. And I told her, I said, listen, I, I don't really want to give you the details, but I need two minutes with your boss if that's possible. She said, come back in 10 minutes. You can have all the time you want. So I came back. And I knocked on the door, and she, I walked in. She said, what can I do for you, Officer Byrne? You know, kind of pulling my chain. And I said, well, I'm going to ask you to do something. I can't really explain any details. I'm really overstepping my bounds, my position. If you think you should report me, then you should. But I'm going to ask you, do you know the intern, Monica Lewinsky? And she said, yes, of course I do. I said, I'm asking you to have her removed as an intern from the West Wing. I'm not telling you to fire her, and I did. Mm-hmm. I just wanted her out of the West Wing, away from because she was constantly, I mean, if she really had a job there, I don't know what it was, but she was constantly manipulating my coworkers, the agents, other employees, trying to put herself in Bill Clinton's path when he was moving around the complex. And it was so clear to me and eventually clear to everybody. So, so you, 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 you were trying to save Bill from himself, and we have was, two minutes, but yeah, yeah get, get, to, get right. to what she walks up to you. <laughs> right. So, so Evelyn said she'll take it under consideration. I get a phone call the next day. Mark has been transferred, and that's the last we're going to see her. A week later, I'm standing in post. I look, and here she comes walking down the hallway. She sees me. She stops. She makes sure her pass is, 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 hold, is you know, hanging face towards me, and she walks towards me holding it out so I can see she has a blue pass. And the blue pass that she had gave her access to anywhere in the complex with the exception of the private living quarters. So, you know, it was clear to me that somebody – way above my pay grade and <laughs> way above Evelyn Lieberman's pay grade, wanted her in the West Wing and wanted her to have access to Bill Clinton. And my guess is it was Bill Clinton. So nice. that's what I came to learn during the, the scandal and the testimony. And they did they did fire Evelyn, right? You found out she was gone all of one oh, day? Evelyn? No, yeah. no. Oh, no, no. No, Evelyn was never fired. Oh. No, she stayed, she stayed quite a few years and then, you know, she transferred on the better things. But no, I don't think everyone got in any trouble. Uh, I, I think, I'll tell you something. She was tough. I don't think they'd go after her. They'd have to, you better bring your, you better pack a lunch. You go after her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we, we have a, a little more than 30 seconds. Gary, t- tell us where, I, I mean, we know where to get your book anywhere on the planet. And, and as, as Susan Lindauer says, people, please buy five of these. And if somebody says, I may be, I may be voting for Hillary. I don't want to say hit them with the book, but hit them with the book and have them read it. And Gary, I want to thank you so much for thank making, you. Thank you because for making my interview, I, it was enjoyable. I was talking right. to a friend. I wasn't doing an interview, and coming up next is Brooks Agnew, and I do consider him a friend. And don't hang up, Gary.